welcome to Toronto Finance International's Upskilling in Action uh, member event. Uh, my name is Jennifer Reynolds and I'm the CEO of Toronto Finance International. And our work in talent is focused on growing and sustaining Toronto's long-term talent advantage, advantage in financial services by leading sector-wide initiatives and research that support the attraction, development, and retention of a world-class in-demand talent pool at the sector level for the benefit of all of our financial services employers. And so our talent group really focuses on providing some thought leadership, engaging our stakeholders on a sector level uh, to really think about some of the most important issues around talent. And uh, certainly the mid-career upskilling is, is a key piece right now. And we looked, we started off this whole exploration into this um, a few months ago with our first part of the study. And the first part of the study looked at what is the demand three, five years from now in terms of skill sets. And we came up with four key areas of skill sets that, that we thought were going to be required. And that was through extensive engagement with um, the sector and with the experts in this area. And then once we were out with that piece, we realized, well, there's the demand side. Now we need to think about the supply side. If these are the skills of the future and we're going to need them in very large numbers, how are we going to find those skill sets? And clearly, some of those skill sets are going to come from new graduates and young people, uh, but we have a lot of talent within the financial sector uh, that has you know, 10 years of experience, 15 years of experience. How do we bring them along? And how are we going to evolve the workforce so that we bring everyone with us on that journey? And so that really is what this particular work is all about. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sasha, the Senior Vice President of our Talent Initiatives, and she will go into uh, this in much more detail. Thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. We are going to extend the theme of learning and development and upskilling through the way that we have structured this member event. It is going to be a learning session instead of a recap of our report. And we are going to learn from dynamic leaders in three of our member organizations that have themselves embarked on their own upskilling journeys and have experience and perspectives and early outcomes to share with us. And so the way that we have structured uh, this event is we are going to have each speaker speak for about 20 minutes, sharing their experience. And then we're going to have 25 minutes for Q&A and discussion, comments, and your own insights about what you've been doing in your own organization. So please, as you're listening, um, jot down or keep in your mind the questions that you want to pose. And if you could just keep them until the end, after the three speakers have spoken, we will bring them all back up and then start our Q&A session. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge um, the PW PwC team in the room that has been our partners through both phases of our future skills research. Uh, we have Joanne Yu, who was integral to the first report that we did uh, on the demand side of things. And then we have Trish Shaheen and Ali Bulat, um, who were critical in the second report that we did. And their leader, Kim Vander Ayrshot wanted to be here and couldn't be, but she is here in spirit with us. So thank you guys for your help. I also want to acknowledge our steering committee for this report. These amazing, experienced, busy people who took time out of their own schedules to share their insights and their um, expertise with us and to guide the work to make sure that we are on track. And we have four um, of those committee members here today. Jay, um, Fred Anger from Ryerson, Madeline Barker from RBC, Andre Gonthier from Sun Life, and Gina Jenneru uh, from BMO. And as well, um, and the three here in, uh, here in spirit with us, Jay Kirsch Allen from LinkedIn, David McDonald from Manulife, and Matthew Smith from Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. Finally, a huge thank you to the 24 organizations who contributed to our research. They, like us, really are stakeholders in making sure that our Canadian workforce has the skills that we are going to need uh, to thrive in the future. So as Jennifer mentioned, um, our future skills work has really so far been in two phases. Looking at the demand side, what are we going to need in terms of future skills over the next three to five years in our sector? And then looking at the supply side, now that we know what we need, are we getting there and how are we going to get there? And we have another talent initiative that I hope that you're all familiar with, Aspire, and that is really having an impact on the early stage talent pipeline. So we've got that covered. What we really wanted to do was look at another critical cohort 
uh, talent cohort, and that's mid-career professionals. For the purposes of our work and our research, we define them as um, individuals 35 to 54 years of age who have 12 to 20 years of experience. Why are we focusing on them? First of all, the size, their sheer size. They make up 87% of the workforce in Canada and well over 50% of the workforce in our financial services sector. On a side note, it's not only us that are thinking that mid-career professionals are important. Um, as many of you likely know, the federal government invested $225 million over four years and $75 million thereafter a year uh, to create an arm's length future skills center that's led by a con consortium headed up by Ryerson. The first um, open call for proposals of that center is for projects to support mid-career workers. And we actually hope that that's gonna be the third phase of our future skills work. We are submitting an application for that funding and the deadline is today. So we'll put it in uh, at the end of today. And um, we'll, we'll let you know how it goes. That will hopefully represent the next phase that we go into. But it's not only because of the sheer size of mid-career workers um, that we wanted to focus on them. We believe that they make ideal um, upskilling candidates, and our research bears that out. They have institutional knowledge, they have work experience, they have a demonstrated desire to learn, um, and they have soft skills. They've got, when we look at the, the future skills that we came up with in the first report, the categories of future skills, three of which, three out of the four of which, really focus on business or soft skills, Mid-career workers who have been in the workforce for this number of years have developed many of those soft skills already. And it forms a good basis um, for upskilling. And so um, I, I actually think that it's particularly relevant for the financial services sector because we really are working with the old and the new, legacy systems and innovation. So mid-career workers, I think, um, with that kind of institutional knowledge and experience in our sector are critical to keep and to upskill. Our, um, I'm just going to say that our research bears that out. Some of the research that we got the slide before, talking about future skills and financial services, our research bears out 66% of executives see addressing potential skills gap related to automation and digitize, bleh, digit, you know what I mean, within their workforces as one of their top 10 priorities, and 30% of them rank it uh, within their top five. And so. That's what our, our research report is really divided into three phases. One is exploring the business imperative behind upskilling. Two is uh, demonstrating a compelling rationale for investing in the mid-career workforce to upskill. And the third is outlining a strategy framework for upskilling. So how should organizations go about um, building future skills within their organizations? And this is where our event gets interesting because I'm not gonna stand up here and give you the theory behind it. We are going to have our three speakers come up from our member organizations and share with us um, what they're doing, their upskilling journey, and really bring that strategy framework to life. So, the way that they will do that, we have Gina, who is going to help set the context for the upskilling imperative and we'll share some of the strategies and innovations that BMO is embarking on to prepare all employees for the future of work. Alan will then share RBC's journey of a targeted upskilling strategy, implementing agile methodology and developing the associated skills needed for employees to be successful in an agile environment. And then Helen will share how Sun Life is employing leading edge technologies and practices to engage employees in upskilling activities. So I'm going to introduce each speaker as they come up. We're gonna start with Gina. And Gina Genero is uh, Chief Learning Officer at BMO Financial Group. She leads the company's focus on advancing performance through learning. Gina is accountable for enterprise learning strategy, design, operations, and governance. She also manages BMO's Corporate University, the Institution of Learning in Toronto, as well as learning sites in Montreal and Naperville. So Gina, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank 
Thank you, everyone. I am so excited to be with you today to be able to talk about this focus on learning and the future of work. So at BMO, we've been on this journey for a little while now, and we've really tried to focus on how do we start now? How do we make decisions now that are the big bets to prepare for the future? And we've had an opportunity over the last few years to be part of some global networks with companies like Microsoft, Google, Fidelity, Disney, Cisco, and others to be able to talk about these mega trends that we're seeing coming down the pipe and what it means for the types of decisions we need to make about our people and need to make about upskilling, reskilling, and new opportunities and just thinking differently in the whole people system for how we're able to set the groundwork now to be prepared for the future of work. And at the heart of all of it, increasingly, is this focus on skills, which you saw in the TFI report. And it's, it's coming through everywhere, because it really is becoming this common currency, some, this thing that knits everything that we're doing together. And it empowers employees. It empowers our entire workforce. But it also drives new insights and new capabilities for our companies. And so today, I want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing as those, those key megatrends on the horizon what it means for the big bets we're making at BMO and what we're doing, and some of the early insights that we've started to see around where we're moving the dial. And so when it comes to the megatrends, there have been a number that, uh, that we've talked about in a TFI forum, as well as the things that all of you are reading about, learning, and so on. And these are the six that we're particularly focused on at BMO. So the first of them is technology, which is no surprise. And it's all about in enabling and disrupting business models. It's about driving new skill requirements. But interestingly, it's also increasing the value that we're placing on human work and the things that people can do to differentiate themselves from the technology and the value of the human and machine partnerships. We're seeing digital, which is so closely related, but really that's tapping into the power of artificial intelligence. It's tapping into the personalization at scale. And it's enabling people to be able to create these experiences for our customers that make it feel like it was made for me. And if you're anything like me, your very best experience with any company frames what you expect from every other one. So if we were to all pull out our smartphones, we probably have a lot of the same models right now. But I'm willing to bet that all of us have different backgrounds on our phone, you know, kids, pets, other things that are important to us. We have different apps. We have different ways that we use them. And the technology actually gets to know us over time. Well, that's what our, our customers are expecting from all the companies that they deal with. And so it really requires us to have a different kind of digital skill, a different kind of AI capability within our teams to be able to create those experiences. We're seeing simplicity being so critical. And that's about choosing to be simple rather than choosing to be complicated. And simple's hard. It's hard to make those conscious choices. And it's about your choices on infrastructure, on process, on customer and employee experience, and making it as simple as it can be so that you're creating things that are, are smart and intuitive and easy to use and effective. We're seeing, of course, shifts in, in people. And, and Sasha talked about this. We have five generations in the workforce, five generations in our customer base. We have a number of different expectations, a number of different um, views. And it's enabling us to tap into the power of diversity and inclusion in ways that we've probably never been able to before. And it's not just around the multi-generational and multicultural workforce, but it's about different experiences, backgrounds, perspectives. And all of that is making us stronger as companies. But it's also changing the expectations that employees have when they come into our companies. And then when it comes to social, of course, social media is a part of that. But it's really even more broadly about social innovation, social enterprise, enabling people to be part of something that's bigger than themselves, and being able to make a difference in their community, for their colleagues, for their customers. And so we're seeing this power of social actually driving greater requirements around governance, transparency, and trust. And finally, economic. And in some ways, this is at the culmination of the other five, and it's the financial impact of it. But we're also seeing elements come through like record low unemployment. And so as you think about our ability to, to grow, move, attract talent, 
it's becoming increasingly difficult as you identify these key skill sets for the future to be able to find people off the street who have the skills you need because everyone's looking for the same skill set. And so I think that op offers an opportunity because so many of us are focused on creating amazing career experiences for the people in our companies. And that's really important. It's important as, as an employer. It's important for the culture that you have in your company. It's important for the way that you're able to really connect with the people in your organization and set them up for success. It's also a business imperative because you can't get enough talent off the street fast enough. There was a Gartner study not too long ago that said they expect 30% of tech jobs by next year to be sitting vacant around the world because there aren't enough people to fill them. And Cybersecurity Ventures says that by 2021, there'll be 3. million cybersecurity jobs in the world that can't be filled because the talent isn't there. So as we think about going out and finding people with those skills, there's not a huge pool to be able to draw from. So it's critically imperative that we make sure that we're hiring within and are um, promoting from within and developing those skills from within. In addition to those mega forces that we're seeing, we're also seeing a change in what people expect from careers. So I've been with the bank for over 30 years. And when I joined, it was very much expected to be a ladder. Where you come in at a junior role, and then you work your way up. About eight or 10 years ago, we started seeing and talking much more about lattices as careers. So people moving generally up, but developing breadth as they go, moving across to different opportunities in the company. And now we're seeing that really move into a place of meaningful experiences. So those could be large or small. They could be formal or informal. And everyone's collection of experiences is different. And we're really trying to tap into that, in part because I think it's important just in terms of creating nimbleness in your organization, but also because people really expect it. They want to be able to experience hop, in some cases more than organization hop. And so as we're trying to, to hone in on that, one of the things that we've been piloting is called hashtag help wanted. And so it actually enables leaders to post opportunities that could be for two hours, two days, two weeks. And people can put up their hand. And if they have those skill set, apply them in a very different context and actually get to expand their networks, try new opportunities, develop career experiences without leaving their day job. And so that enables us to form fast teams, to be really nimble with resources, but to tap into what employees are looking for in a very different way. And we're just moving to test that at scale now across our company. As we look at that sort of focus on careers and jobs, it's interesting to see that the length of careers is expected to be 60 to 70 years now. So gone are the days of Freedom 55. Uh, and you know, I kind of uh, gasped when I first saw that number. But then I realized you know, with, with advances in artificial intelligence and healthcare, um, people are expected to live much longer. In fact, I was reading that people who were born in the year 2000 have a very good chance of living to be 150 years old. So if you're, if you're living to 150, it's not unusual that you might have 70 years of that working. Um, the average time on job is four to five years. Because the jobs are getting bigger. They're getting more complex. They're getting broader. We're having flatter organizations. So the time that people spend in a role can be longer. We're seeing that people coming out of school, people learning new things, the half-life of a skill is now two to five years. So you have to keep learning all the time. And chances are, more than a third of everything you use in your job today, you probably learned in the last year. And so that means that learning has to be a habit. It has to be something we do all the time every day. And we're seeing that the skills that people are focusing in on, that they need to focus in on, very aligned to the TFI study, it's higher cognitive. It's that creative. It's the ability to draw insights. It's the ability to solve problems in very new ways. It's the social and emotional. That's the human component. Empathy, resilience, judgment. And then technological, where people are actually able to have the skills to build the future that we're all anticipating. And so as we look at that as a backdrop, that creative piece is so critically important. And there's not enough of it. So there's a study that NASA did in, in the 90s where they took 1,600 four- and five-year-olds. And in, in this study, they were able to look at that creativity, that spark. And they considered about 98% of those kids to be creative geniuses. They could solve problems they'd never seen before. They had, they had no restrictions. Everything was like play. They just figured stuff out. So what do you think happened as they followed these kids through grade school, high school, 
into adulthood. What do you think the percentage was by the time they became adults? I hear 10, I hear 3. You're right, it's 2%. And so the, the, the number was actually interesting. It went from 98% before school, 30% in grade school, 12% in high school, 2% as adults. And part of the reason that happens is because when we're in school, we learn how to get the right answer. We don't learn how to solve problems. And so as we look at the workforce now, how do we encourage people to solve problems that may not have a right answer? We may never have seen the problem before. How do you get people to be able to embrace that and figure things out? And so, you know, as you, as you saw um, in the report, that focus on skills and the ability to bring people out of their comfort zone and be able to have them disrupt themselves as you're also disrupting the organization is really critically important. And so what we did, um, we've been on this journey for a few years now, and we've really tried to shake up that focus on learning and change the experience for learning. And back in June, we launched BMOU, which is the anywhere, anytime, palm of your hand learning. And it enables people to learn for their job, for their career, and for their passion. And that passion piece is so critically important because that's the thing that gets people to come back. And so what we want to do more than anything else is make learning a habit, to make sure that people are always learning. And it, they're learning things that matter to them. And so we're not really restrictive about that. We want to make sure that people are tapping into what matters. So the people in my team, in addition to the things that you'd expect, like learning and strategy and design and so on, I've got somebody who follows F1 racing. Someone is into rugby. Someone's into classical painting. And I've been told my own um, learning feed is a little eclectic because I've got, in addition to all of those things, AI and bots and archaeology and, and forensics and um, art and a number of other things. But I actually find that when I'm trying to solve problems, if I get stuck, the best opportunity to get unstuck is by drawing on the things that I've learned that have nothing to do with my day job. And so those are the sparks where I'm able to think of a problem in a whole new way. We're trying to make sure as we focus in on specific skills for the future. So if BMOU is broad, this next program I'm sharing is where we go specific on the skills of the future. We've tried to focus on the technical skills at three levels. So how do we raise the waterline for all employees and make sure we build a foundation of digital fluency, of data acumen, of a number of other topic areas? And then how do we make sure experts are at the, at the top of their game and staying current? And then how do we disrupt leaders so that they are equipped to lead in a new context? And then we're focusing in on the human skills, the power skills that people need to be able to set themselves apart from technology and work really effectively with technology and each other. And so the BMO Forward is something that we, um, we launched the first stream back in March. And it's focused on data science, analytics, artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, and data visualization. Shelley and Janet, keep me honest. Um, and um, so we launched that in March. We launched a cybersecurity stream a couple weeks ago in April. Coming soon is Digitech, um, which is digital and technology skills and using workplace tools effectively, as well as technology development for the people who are experts. And then process excellence, working on that simplicity, that efficiency, and building acumen in that all across the company. And you'll notice we're focusing in on the employee and the leader level there because we already have a robust program for experts, uh, white belt, green belt, and black belt. So we're really trying to cover the waterfront in terms of those skills that we're seeing being really critical. And we're making sure that we're putting those opportunities in the hands of all 45,000 people in all 29 countries where we operate. So we've gone big bang for all of these streams. And early insights around the first stream. So in the first four weeks, we had about 700, more than 700 people who jumped in to learn it. And they're spending about two to three hours between the learning and then the actual application. And that application is so important, so we've got assignments that we have them do. And if they're able to learn and apply, then they earn uh, recognition. They earn a um, digital certification around that. And then we, we found that, very in line with the TFI report, more than a half of all the people who jumped in to do this learning are actually those mid-career professionals. And so the people who were most hungry for it fastest 
are the ones that we're talking about in this report. We saw some early insights around impact in terms of confidence, curiosity, and relevance. So in terms of confidence, we saw a six-point jump between the, the scores before the program and after the program in people's confidence in understanding data science and related topics. We saw 12% increase in people actually being curious and wanting to learn more now. So now that we've opened that door, now that they've done the preliminary learning, they want to keep it going. And 100% or close to 100% of everyone who's gone to do the learning has joined a community of learners who are continuing to discuss, comment, share resources, and so on. And then 14-point bump in people who would actually consider a job in data science now that they've done this learning. So that's uh, a really important number for us. And that's only in the first four weeks of the program. So we're seeing that we're getting some traction early on. As we think about upskilling and reskilling, it's so important for us to really break out of our own ideas about what that can look like. One of the best stories I've seen is coding for coal miners. Have any of you seen the YouTube video? It's a really neat story. They took a number of coal miners from the US, southern US, and a coding company came in and taught them coding skills. Now on the surface, coal mining and coding don't seem all that much alike. But if you think about it, in both cases, you need to be able to see the big picture. You need to be able to go deep on the details. You need to be able to work systematically to get things done. And so by teaching them coding, they actually now have their own coding business, um, these miners. They, they've been able to take sort of the way they're naturally wired and apply it in a whole different domain. So as we're thinking about the opportunities for us reskilling people, looking at the jobs that may actually become pretty routine or automated as we pull out the routine work, how do we take those people and map them into new opportunities that maybe have never existed in our company before? But how do we create the development plans that move them from here to here, where they have the aptitude to be really successful? So we're working with HR professionals in the business to be able to start to make those linkages and create the bridge so that we can have our own stories that are like the coal mining to coding. So as you've seen, like over and over again, we're finding, whether it be broad or whether it be narrow, this focus on skills is becoming a critical enabler for both individuals and the business. And we're actually tying it into our view around the HR system and the employee life cycle. So if you think about all of your experiences as an employee, from the day you first come in, onboarding, learning, developing, growing, pursuing your career, there's actually a skills component that wraps all around the outside of that. So we're gearing up for a new HR system at BMO in January, and we're actually doing the legwork now to take our skills library and connect it, cluster it to match up with our job families, to connect with performance, to connect with careers, to connect with succession, so that we have one common currency, one common backbone that links all of these elements of the HR system so that we can start to make it super easy for employees. You know, if they have an interest in a job, well, what are the skills required? What skills do I have? Where do I need to develop? Target in on the learning, compete for the roles. And we're able to get new insights and be able to actually go out and mine for curiosity, mine for capability, be able to find the pockets of the organization where these skills are being built up and start to connect them to opportunities within the company. So we see this as a critical enabler for the company and for our employees. And part of the reason we're doing this is because we know that we have to equip people to be ready for anything. As much as we can look at these big megatrends on the horizon, as much as we can make big bets, they are educated guesses. And we may not be 100% right. But the most important thing we can do is help every one of our employees be able to learn, grow, develop for the future, tap into their curiosity. There's a great quote that says, learning ignites curiosity we never even knew we had. And so my question to you is, what are you curious about? What are you going to start learning about today? Thank you. OK, and we have Alan Richardson uh, to come up. Alan is the Vice President of Learning and Development at RBC. He leads the Enterprise Learning and Development Group, which designs and delivers innovative learning solutions for employees globally across RBC and delivers award-winning internship programs such as Career Launch and the Graduate Leadership Program. 
Allen is accountable for executing the strategy to reimagine learning in a rapidly transforming business environment and introducing innovation learning approaches in support of building a digitally enabled relationship bank. Welcome, Alan. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having us here. Alan, uh, here's your clicker. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Um, I will say uh, uh, full disclosure two things here. One, uh, I'm what you're five months on four months on the job is that right six months i'm six you're four on five whatever it is i'm very new on the job and, I, and, and so what the story i'm going to tell is actually a three and a half almost four year journey now so in many cases i was an observer a, 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 a participant and in some small parts not learning leading it but certainly uh, the story i'm telling is really i'm standing on the shoulder of giants as i look forward to the upscale journey around agile at rbc um and i have to get up um, uh, the other blue um, the, uh, the the other caveat that I want to make is I am going to I'm not a technologist so I'm going to refer to agile in two different ways and this always causes confusion so I'll try to be specific. I'm going to refer to agile projects, which would be what you consider sort of technical agile, agile done to accomplish a specific aim in an iterative fashion using uh, uh, approaches such as Scrum or something like that. I will also refer to, and I'll try and keep these things, business agility, which is the use of agile principles to make your enterprise more agile, more dynamic, more adaptable, all the things that, you know, is right in the are so critical for us as we go forward. So call me out if I get it wrong. Madeline, hang on. She's going to get it wrong. I'm going to get wrong. Try and be clear. Um, I'm going to tell the story in three parts of our journey, where we started, which is really that technical journey recognizing the need to build technical agile skills and all the things that go around supporting that use of agile as a project delivery method. Um, where we've been over the last year and a half or so, which is taking that and really expanding it beyond. So doing agile, not just for technical delivery, but also for non-technical strategic project delivery as well. And then where we are today, I can't share uh, as much as, as I hope to in about six months, but I'll certainly talk about what our early thinking is on. Where do we go with business ability and what does that look like going forward? That's a big part of how we continue on our agile journey. Um, you know, I think this is something where, uh, you know, if you look over that time frame of those three and a half years, it's a long time for an enterprise that's spent sort of 150 years doing it one way and is trying to do it a totally different way. It's actually a very short time frame, all told. Um, forces of change, uh, Gina did such a fabulous job articulating the forces of change. What I thought I would do here is point out a couple that I think are very specific to the agile journey that you need to be aware of. One is the pace. And so if you think about the accelerating pace of change, that's where you start to do agile. Because you recognize that a waterfall method or a sort of more traditional hierarchical way of running your company does not give you the pace to manage the change that is happening around you. And that was clearly something that Dave McKay and Bruce Ross, our head of technology, have really saw back in 2015 as they went to the board and said, we need to massively invest in our agile capability. The other one I think I would point out, which is very pertinent for us in the HR, is around the work for talent. We were looking for these skill sets that are so in demand. And you're saying, well, I can't leverage modern methods of delivery, modern tools, modern concepts. No one's going to want to work for me. And I can't even start on this journey if I don't hire at least some expertise to get us there. So I, I think those are two that are very real if you're starting down an agile journey on it. I assume most of you are some way down or even fully down the agile journey. But that, I think, are two that really matter in agile. The third that is worth mentioning is agile should, at its best, start. I'm going to cut you off. Yes. We're not yeah. picking up your uh, sound. Okay. You I'll try. It's on. It's Thank on. you. Is that better? Excellent. That's way better. All right. Um, it, the the client focus, the iterative nature of Agile, bringing the client into it, I think is such an important element of Agile delivery. Um, and that is also a, an essential aspect of it. As we refocused as uh, on the client um, and we went through a sort of uh, culture transformation at RBC, you know, making sure that everything we did, not just, you know, the salespeople, but throughout the organization being focused on the client was very important to us. So starting at the beginning then, so back in August of 2015, Bruce, our head of technology, and Dave, CEO, went to the board and said, we need to make a massive investment in technology. Um, at the time, they said uh, half a mil billion dollars, $500 million. Um, I'm sure it's more than that now. Um, but uh, certainly, you know, understanding that we had to build 
our infrastructure, modernize our infrastructure, build a far better consumer facing experience for our clients, the point of being a digitally enabled relationship bank, and build the capabilities we require to be able to move at that pace that we're looking to do in the modern world, um, they, they had this big ask. And as a part of that ask, we recognized the need to invest in and develop our agile capabilities. Prior, and, and I'm going a little bit off anecdote, but prior, you know, we knew the Agile concepts. I mean, it's been around for a long time, and certainly the bank had delivered Agile projects here and there prior to 2015, but they were very small numbers. In 2013, going to the board, they said, we will drive Agile, we will build it very rapidly, and we will do 150 deliveries in 2016. And what that meant was, as I said, a combination of build, buy, and rent. We had to, we had to go hire some people. We had to rent some expertise because we just couldn't find it. And that, you pay quite a premium. But for the long term, we had to go build this expertise. And that's where, where we started. And that, that began with understanding what do we really mean when we're saying building agile capability. And I think you're looking at three things. I already mentioned there's the technical skills. So if you're doing project delivery through Agile, you need to have the skills that are required to deliver that through that method. We use Scrum, so that means having people who know Scrum and be our Scrum masters, Agile coaches who can advise the senior leadership and the, and the product owners, thinking about differently about how you do your product ownership versus, say, a P&L management in the way you, you design and deliver your products over time. So that technical knowledge and capability was critical. The second was the, 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 the sort of individual soft skill development. So Gina mentioned these critical skills around creative. Now, you know, breaking down hierarchy, being comfortable questioning, being out there and collaborative in the way you communicate and share knowledge. Working in that agile lab forces that to a certain extent, but people who are in their mid-career, that takes a bit of time and that takes you know, training and coaching and, and support to get you there. And the third, and possibly the most important, was the leader mindset. And really thinking about how, you know, Bruce was clearly there, but he had an organization that had been working, the technology organization had been a service provider for years. They were a cost center. They were used to being told, don't spend anything, stop. You know, go, you know, and now they're being said, no, you're a strategic partner. You have to be at the table. You have to be helping us drive this business forward. Technology is a client-facing, critical element of our business, not just something we do in the dark corners of our organization. And so how do you make that switch? was a huge part of it, and that leader mindset, the awareness of where leaders support Agile and where they actually take away from the skill set was so important. I think you can broaden that to any skill set you're trying to introduce in an organization, but for Agile, it was so important. Now, it was helpful to have Bruce, who understood it. He was new to RBC. He'd come from IBM, so he understood it. He lived it. He liked it, and he was obviously pushing very hard for it, but it was building uh, and actually running, uh, we call them people manager forums, but essentially leadership sessions on a regular basis that continue to introduce the concepts and the capabilities that managers and leaders needed to, uh, to help their teams as we, as we grew agile through the organization. I want to go back to the, the first point, the technical skills briefly, and just pause on one specific one, which was, which was huge for us. You know, one of the things that we, was recognized early on, and Gina you know, references, there's a hunger to learn these skills. And especially once the CEO and the head of technology start to say, hey, Agile is really important to us, suddenly it's what is it, what my boss tells me is important, I find fascinating, right? <laughs> so that, that's basically it. So we couldn't, and we couldn't move as many people as we liked through formal training all at once. That, you know, you've, you've got limitations on classrooms and just general logistics. But what you can do is set up a self-learning. And many of us now are using platforms, which I think are becoming much more common. Um, you know, we're, we're using Degreed, if you're familiar with it, but as a self-learning platform. But at the time, these were pr relatively new technologies. So they essentially set up a very simple type of that, but looking at what is the... Uh, way that we can help people do self-directed learning around Agile. A couple of important things about this is it wasn't simply a go find interesting content on Agile, go read about Agile. There were actually milestones, proficiency levels, and a very thoughtful dialogue and experience-based uh, uh, certification, not a formal certification like a, you know, a chartered accountant or something like that, but an informal internal view of you need to have done these things and then we consider you proficient at Agile, or you need to have done these things and taken these self-directed learning pathways and then we consider you proficient in Agile. And that 
was huge and actually unleashed a lot of folks. And on the prior page, I noted over 2,000 folks benefited. That was within a year. We got a huge number of people who were engaging within technology. And it was still very much a technology-focused effort at this point, trying to build that core capability. But we got them through this. And in part, it was through the self-directed. And then they would find the experiences, whether their managers were giving them exposure or they were applying for the new roles that were coming up. And since we knew they had the proficiency, we could bring them into the projects. And it's funny now because we're, we're undertaking our, our core HR replacement and we were asking, I think it was about two years ago, he said, how many scrum masters do we have out there? And we looked in our HR system and they were like 20. And we're like, that doesn't feel right, like people who actually have scrum master capability. And then we looked in our agile tool and it was like 400 or something like that. And you're like, okay, now we need to go update the HR systems. <laughs> um, so that, that's the first wave of the journey. The second wave of the journey is really how you start to think about how do I build this capability, not just in the technical disciplines, but actually across the organization? And one of the reasons that you get there is you start to recognize these tech technical projects are running ahead and other parts of the business, risk, finance, HR, are not keeping up with the pace or even the business is not keeping up with the pace of what the technical team can now deliver. And so you're starting to build the capability everywhere. and. Um, back away from the slide here so you can see it, um, you know, that really, again, combines into some formal training, building sort of what are the minimum requirements for you to become part of an agile team, be it technical or non-technical. You know, how do you uh, continue to advance proficiency and know sort of what are the levels uh, of that capability? Um, but then, again, that ever important informal community uh, that we wanted to have, and we use a, a social network called Jive, but if you go into, we call it RBC Connect, if you go into that, that tool, there are, there are incredible communities of experts, support, uh, you know, again, self-learning, self-directed learning that you can go to for coaching and, and uh, insight. What I thought I'd pause on here is one of the formal methods we use, which, which uh, we called RBCX. And it was actually a secondment program, and it was an immersive experience. So we recognized we couldn't give everybody an experience overnight. Um, but we did want to, as best as we can, build advocates throughout the organization who had experienced it in a meaningful way, uh, such that they could go back and say, you've got to try this, or we've got to get to Agile. And so we started a, a two-month program called RBCX, where we'd second people out of any role. There was no limit to who could apply to it. It could be from any level. It didn't tend to be uh, senior leaders, uh, but it was anybody sort of from a director level down. Um, and uh, you were given a real business problem. And actually, it's one of the great things every year. Our operating committee in HR would be like, okay, which, you know, you get like five different suggestions for projects we could give to RBCX, and you'd pick the one that you, we were allowed to put forward. Um, and, uh, you know, one year I was uh, sponsoring an onboarding project with RBCX, and there was a risk person, and there was a person from HR, and there was a person from finance, and I think a person from our Canadian banking or retail organization. So people who, you know, our employees, so have obviously have been onboarded, but don't have any particular expertise in onboarding. The insights they brought in an eight-week Agile Sprint were amazing. But more importantly, all four of them got training from great ex experts and then went back to their groups, these huge advocates of the Agile method, because they saw how much could be done. And frankly, we took that work and we started to deliver against the outcomes. So we also got an organizational benefit from it. And we can do that because of how um, short it is, we can do that at scale and we can repeat it over and over again. So you're not just having, you know, four people go through at a time, you're actually having 20, 30 go through it at a time, mul handling multiple projects. And you have, you know, you're investing in the infrastructure to support that. But it builds such great advocate understanding and starts to really spread it out throughout the organization. So then we've built technical skill we've started to really build it out everywhere across the organization. You can go anywhere and sort of find someone who's been a part of or led an Agile project. Um, at, the, at this point, as an example, HR has four persistent Agile, we call it HR Accelerator, but it's four persistent Agile teams that basically go from project to project trying to accelerate the delivery of our Agile work. Um, and most functional business uh, organizations have a, have a cadre of people that are delivering. In, in the last number I heard was well over 300 projects of technical projects that TNO were delivering. So this is, a, this is now a pervasive thing from an agile project standpoint. So now I have to flip over to the other type of agile. So are we an agile business? And I think we're still working there. And that's part of the next phase of the journey, 
which is really about where do we go. And as we've launched it, as I mentioned, some of the things we start to identify are, one, these projects, these agile folks are moving or expecting to move at a far faster pace than the, than the legacy organization can move. Another part of that is prioritization. We, you know, you prioritize on a PNL budget in sort of the, the, the traditional world with the agile, with the ba backlog and how you're managing that prioritization actively every couple weeks. It's a much more meaningful way to stay focused on what's really important. And the challenge is if we don't prioritize at the strategic level in that sort of really active dialogue way, the agile projects end up running off in a certain direction. And then six months later, the leadership goes, no, 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 wait. We're going over this way. But the Agile project's probably already delivered by then. So how do you keep the pace of prioritization at a way that it matches where the Agile is? The second is, to that same point, the alignment to strategy. So if you're only prioritizing once a year, once every a couple times a year, that, that alignment has a lot of opportunity to stray. And Agile keeps it on point. Right? There's check-ins every two weeks, readouts every two weeks with our HR labs. You know, we have a public forum on our floor, actually, uh, 180 Wellington. And the Agile labs are reading out, here's what we're doing. You know, it, the operating committee members are there, but so is every other employee, providing feedback, providing direction, and ensuring maintenance to strategy. Um, funding. Funding has been a huge issue. Because again, if you fund once a year, but the Agile project starts to realize something's different, they need more, they need less, you're suddenly out of sync with your funding, as well as measurement. How are you measuring success is different in an Agile world than it is in a traditional world. Um, and then the other opportunity, as I mentioned, is leader-led. So while people understood how an Agile project was delivered, I would say now we have to get the leader mindset to how does an Agile organization work? And that's, that's a big leap for us. And so we have a framework, and that's a... Uh, that's you know in, in classic form we always have a framework sorry and uh it's really about the different cons the principles that we think are critical for an agile business or organization some of them we've already talked about um some of them are a bit different so how you design your teams right the traditional hierarchy doesn't work for an ad a business uh, an agile business um you know how you think about where the customer sits at the table so within a project that's fairly obvious how do you think about that from a business standpoint, right? There's that famous, you know, having an empty seat for your client kind of, who was that, Apple or someone? Anyways, but how do you really bring that into the way you're prioritizing your work and setting strategy? Uh, thinking about leadership and culture, again, that mindset, and we've really revamped in the last couple of years our leadership model, but making sure our leaders are living that leadership model and especially the points of how to adapt and how to learn quickly and move on not just in a specific instance, but from an overall strategic standpoint. And part of what's been going on in parallel to this agile development is really an update of our legacy infrastructure, now having tools that actually support agile delivery and development, where if you're trying to configure relative to an old legacy system that you need to spend millions just to customize to get what you're doing out the door, it, it inhibits, absolutely inhibits agile delivery. So making sure we have the infrastructure, the leadership, and the sort of toolkit and, and capabilities required to work in an agile way. Um, you know, we are piloting this now. We've, we've had a couple businesses, like full business units that have gone to this method. Um, and the results are phenomenal. They, they absolutely love the way of working. It is a huge change, especially for leaders, people who have been working in a certain way for 20, 30 years. Um, but once they get comfortable with it, and once they get used to letting go sort of the day-to-day -day decision making to the, to the teams that are delivering using Agile method, and they are more focused on strategy, alignment, and prioritization, it's magic. And, it, and you see the pace of the business and the pace of delivery pick up uh, in credible time, terms. I thought I would just comment, because I think there's many different ways to, move, to, to, to uh, take this journey forward. And I will do a, there we go. You know, there is the Big Bang approach. And if you've heard of the ING story, they kind of went to Agile all at once, literally overnight. They fired everybody one day and then said, reapply for the job you want in this new organizational construct that was leveraging, leveraging business agility principles. And they rehired everybody sub a certain percentage that they were trying to uh, uh, eliminate roles for uh, back into the organization. And it was literally from an employee standpoint, yesterday I was working in a traditional method, tomorrow I'm working in an Agile method. 
that's one way to go. I think the other is a protected way, right? You kind of hive off the agile organization, you keep them separate, you let them grow and develop and mature. Classic sort of disruption strategy where you want to disrupt yourself from, from the outside or from the inside. RBC, I think culturally, we couldn't really do either of these. I think if we had done a big bang, the, the, the leadership feeling was it would have been too fast, the risks of failure would have been too high, we're you know, too big to fail banks, so there's, there's some con considerations there. But they also felt that if we did it too much in a protected setting, those leading traditional groups would feel uh, you know, targeted, they would get either be organ rejection kind of feel, and how do you actually reabsorb those groups once they've matured and become stable? So we did do a grow from within, which is what I've essentially described. Building pockets, building it all over the organization, trying to seed it as much as you can, and working top down and bottom up at the same time. And for us, culturally, that's really worked, because I think it's built trust in the method, it's built advocacy, but it is if you, you know, if you're going, if you want fast results, you're going to do it this way. If you want fast sort of outcomes, like in the, in the complete sense, you're going to go this way. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's a little bit, um, you know, what, what works best for you. And there's many examples now of people who have made that journey. Um, you know, other than that, some lessons learned. The leadership mindset is really important. And where we see Agile really struggling in an organization, like as not, there are leaders who are actively resisting or unsure of how to behave in an Agile manner and unsure how to, how to deal with a team that's working in Agile, dipping in too deeply and trying to direct the team day to day. Um, team enablement, this is across people, process, and technology. When we've set up persistent Agile teams, we have talent squads who sit with the team uh, who actually help them with all their needs because they work at such a different pace. And if you're not enabling them at the pace of the agile world, they can't deliver. It's the same thing from a technology standpoint, same thing in process standpoint. So in some cases, we've had a dual speed world where we have sort of the traditional ways of doing things. And then we've got what we do to, to sort of give a express route for agile teams to get through. Knowing your audience, I think, is especially when you're talking about mid-career folks, how do you encourage them and get them excited about what they're doing? Um, and then uh, patient urgency, you know, from, especially from a learner standpoint, you can't do this overnight. And especially, as I said, for RBC, you know, three and a half years seems like a blink of an eye. But at the same time, you can't wait for the next step. So be urgent to take the next step, but realize that the full journey doesn't happen overnight. Thank you very much. And now we have Helen Pank. Helen is the Vice President of Talent Acquisition and Development at Sun Life Financial. A seasoned HR leader, Helen has held increasingly senior roles throughout her career in leading global organizations in both Asia and North America. She has developed strong expertise over the last 17 years in various HR disciplines, including organizational development, talent management, learning and development, executive development, and HR business partnerships. Welcome, Helen. Good day, everyone. Ready for coffee? <laughs> I can see so many eyes. Say, like, mm, where's my coffee? <laughs> I think Alan pointed out, I'm actually new in the role. I was heading up global talent development for Sun Life for uh, 30,000 employees uh, across the globe in 26 countries since January 1st. Good start of the year. I was given also talent acquisition. Uh, in my portfolio, it's totally different ball game. Fortunately, I have the experts such as Andre in my team to help me accelerate my learning curve. So today, I'm very happy to share with you some of the practices we have done in Sun Life. When we talk about upscaling workforce and build capabilities, there are so many facets. I know Gina, Alan, and I, we're going to take different angles to tackle this. So today, I'm taking a very practical angle is on how. So what we have done at Sun Life to innovate and to create some of the learning solutions to help learner to learn. It's a busy slide. I'm not intending to walk you through details. I want to show a journey that we have gone through in terms of how we learn uh, at Sun Life. Before I start, simple question. What's the difference between training and learning?
I think you probably all know the answer why we kind of shift from like training development to learning development. Training is an event. No matter it's two days, three days, two weeks, three months, it's an event. Learning is continuous. It's nonstop. You learn anywhere, anytime, through any devices, and you don't even feel you're learning something because they become part of your day to day. So when I walk this journey with you, I want to point out traditionalized on life, we were really more of the training event. We have the corporate type of training. We have multi-day programs, which most of you are familiar with. And we're looking at different um, hierarchy uh, levels, right? If you're a director, we have a terrific program called AHP, Advanced High Performance. And we have a lot of good components in it. I call that goodies. It's like a gift basket, all good goodies. And then we're going to hand over to Andre, we're going to hand over to Gina, we're going to hand over to Alan, and they receive the same gift basket because we assume you have the same needs. I joined Sun Life in 2017, January. January is my start of a new job. The first question I ask, how do we learn today? When we want to learn something, do we wait for six months to take a training? No. We Google, we YouTube, we will ask the expert around. We find the answer, and we need the answer now, right? A tiny example, maybe not so appropriate to the gentleman, but for ladies, you know. I had a pair of silver earrings, and I was ready to go out with that because that matched my outfit. And then I found them tarnished. It's dark. It's black. How many of you have that experience? But I need them now. What do I do? YouTube. Right away, I'm telling you the recipe. Two spoons of baking soda, <laughs> one sheet of aluminum foil, boiling in the water 10 seconds, put your silverware in, take out, shining like brand new. Take that recipe back. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, we change the way we learn. We can learn at the moment and apply it right away, right? And then you come back to corporate learning. The question is, why corporate learning is so different from personal learning? It shouldn't be, shouldn't it be the same? Right. So we took a look at that, and then we look at also our strategy. Our CEO launched our Client for Life strategy actually three months prior to my arrival. And we really want to put a client in the center. At the same time, build the capability on digital transformation, on data analytics, on financial discipline, and of course, talent and culture. And we look at the traditional way of learning. It just doesn't suit how we want to develop new capabilities. Example, data analytics. No matter you're vice president or you're a consultant or you're a claim representative, you all need to be to build that digital capability and data analytics capability. So we actually switched our talent framework from more of a hierarchical one to capability-based. And we also want to instill the contemporary way of learning. That's what I call the personal way of learning. We all know, people tell us, we cannot afford those three-day programs because business is happening. I'm handling all these things. So to take Learning as an event on the side is more of a burden rather than a pleasure. So how we can modulize that, make it easy, make it simpler for the learners so they can actually embed in their day-to-day. -day. So some of, the approach, some of the approaches I'm showing today is really along that line. Now, in two weeks, we're actually launching a new learning management system. So we're creating a Netflix of learning for our learners. And not only you think of it as a tremendous configuration of the complex um, project, you also think that we have about over 200 administrators who have access to this learning management system and then upload content and create in different languages. We're also migrating the content and we use it as interface for the learner to find a home. So they're going to come here, and we have all our learning resources on that home. I was joking with my colleagues that we're moving. We're moving. We're packing up from the traditional content management system to a learning management system. It's not a move from 
downtown Toronto to Mississauga. It's a move from China to Canada. It's huge. And that will enable us to do a lot of things that we wish we could do before, like social learning. I could access to your um, learning list, just like you access someone else's music list, right? <clears throat> I can be curious of saying, hey, what are you learning? How am I going to you know, kind of emulate that? I can have mobile learning. We have a digital badging. We're going to build gamification in it. So we're really looking forward to that. How many of you have seen this? This is Burson Deloitte, famous infographic for learning. A lot of content, of course. But I want to call out is this 24 minutes per week. That's the reality we're facing. How many of employees say, I really want to learn new things, but I don't have time? Time is the biggest threat to learning today. 24 minutes per week, that's the average a learner can afford. So what can we do to maximize that 24 minutes per week? Some of the things we created, <clears throat> we call it green learning. Essentially, it's virtual learning. Because before, we'll bring people to the classroom, flying them everywhere, and then coming together for three days. So now, we'll bring them down. We'll modulize the learning. We'll look at 90 minutes learning per module, per topic. We still have live facilitator. It's not just a, a webinar. You know, you walk through your slides. There could be also assessment you have done before. There's a breakout room. There's interaction. You see each other on the video. Right? You have that virtual in interaction. Why it's called green learning? Because there's no travel, no lunch booked, no classroom reserved, no print out your materials. So it's all done in a green way. And the best part of it is we actually allow the learners from all over the world to access learning at the same time. And in a, such an easy way, they can build in their calendar. They don't need to put aside additional time for training. This is actually part of their day-to-day. -day. So as you can see, we'll reach our global audience in many, many locations, especially those who cannot afford to fly into um, a big city to take the training. So we reach them in a virtual way. And the best location is my favorite, home. So many people can actually access that and learn with others from home. I think I'm losing my voice. Too passionate about it. 24 minutes a week. Do you have one minute? I'm sure you do. So we start to tackle that. We introduce a concept of one minute learning. So we have a digital library with a curated learning content on articles or videos. It's a one minute summary. And if you are interested in knowing more, you click, you can have the full article or full videos. And those curated content, we get it from 62 credible sources. Uh, like every two weeks, the employee is going to get a push email saying, hello, this is your one minute learning. So we encourage people to um, check the content they're interested in. Another thing we did in house is one minute video. We call that my learning minute. So we empower and invite our senior leaders to talk about practical tips on how they learn or how they um, done certain things in one minute. We have a clock, actually. And we have shot quite a few uh, videos. And it's you know, in line. And we're expanding it globally. So we have our Asian leaders also taking a minute learning. And we post on social media because we have workplace. It's like Facebook at work, we post on that, and global employees have access to it. And so far, we've got a tremendous positive feedback. I want to take a minute to talk about um, an experiment we had with virtual reality. I know Gina had heard me talk about that before. In 2017, we actually created um, an immersive experience with the top 100 global leaders. They're like senior VPs and above. Every year, they come together for a three-day offsite. In fact, our Client for Life strategy was actually um, released on that type of platform. So I got the opportunity to actually create something interesting and innovative. 
So what we did is we partnered with a vendor. There's no off-the-shelf product for anything related to virtual reality in terms of business application yet, I have to say. Did a lot of digging, talked to 10 different vendors, and then the idea just came say, why can't we co-create an experience? So what we did is we created a Sun Life app. We sourced over 50 client cases, real client cases from Asia, US, and Canada. And then we have our employees as actors. We actually shot um, 360 videos and built gamification in it. And we have our leaders go through this experience and competing against each other live. So essentially what happened is I have a client who have a scenario and she is sitting in front of me in the virtual reality world and talking to me about her situation. And then as a leader, I need to make a decision on how I'm gonna address the situation. I'll have two different choices, but none of them is perfect. And I have time pressure to make a decision. Every time I make a decision, that triggers points on either client trust or revenue generation or overall satisfaction. So sometimes I can say, oh, oh, I stick to the principle, I got more revenue, but I lose client trust. Then your overall satisfaction is not there. So the leaders are under time pressure. They're forced to make decisions right there. And they found this really powerful, why? Example, if I send you a accommodation letter or a complaint letter and you read it, versus someone sitting in front of your face and telling you the story. What is the difference? That's that emotional connection. So the leaders really felt compelled when the client was talking to them about their situation. They also realized every single decision I make on a daily basis, sometimes it's fast decision, but impact directly on client's life. So I think through that experiment, you know, the leaders was able to identify also the strong connection with the client and how we can use simulation, leveraging VR to really train our employees. We also ask them to think broader. Um, at the moment, we ask them to write down the fresh ideas they have in terms of how they can leverage technology to do things differently in their business unit. And we actually collected all those ideas, and there were you know, a whole list of ideas, which is really, really, um, for me, excited to see. We replicated this experience with our CEO Award winners, also 100 people. They also came up with a lot of ideas. We now take virtual reality in our learning bootcamp. Uh, in Hong Kong, they're using that for the real life coaching as well. So that's another experiment we have with technology. Quickly, how many of you use Skillsoft library? I'm sure a lot of Skillsoft customers. There are tons of information, right? A lot. So our learners are saying, great information, but it's like swimming in the sea of learning content. I don't know where to find stuff. So we do, our team, look at some of the topics, and we created some curated learning guide for them. So on one topic all linked directly to the classroom training, to the videos, to um, some of the self-directed uh, learning resources, skills of it as well. And at least our HR business partner found it very handy, and they can actually use our employees and leaders directly. A quick example about another um, attempt on mobile nudges. I think some of you probably also in the learning world we all wonder how we can sustain learning impact, right? After you take you know, a training event or you have a learning initiative, how do we know you actually apply what you learn in a job? We try with one of our, um, we call that boot camp called Coaching for Great Work. So every week after um, the learners take that course, take that workshop, we have mobile nudges. So. Hi, we have talked about this, have you used it? So we're kind of like trying to experiment how people feel about it without knowing them so much, right? And, and we did a survey uh, after some period, 87% of the learners said they actually changed at least one behavior. I thought it was freaking awesome, 
And 80% of their success attribute to the mobile nudges. So I think it's a good experiment, and we are actually looking at all our programs or learning initiatives, trying to use different approaches to really help people in a very short period of time. Fast, easy, but remind them. Last but not least, we have to think and act as a marketer. So I keep talking to my team saying, as an L&D professional, we're not just creating learning solutions. We really need to tell people what's the benefit, why they need to learn this stuff, what they're interested in, right? We need to make our communication easier. We, make, make, we need to make it simpler. We used to have like a big paragraph, so when we say, hey, this is a learning program, invite you. How many people read? Probably nobody, right? We're all busy, we have our inbox full. You had a glance, and how many times you just delete directly? So we want to make it simple, visual, capture your attention right away in the 15 seconds you have. So we started to create infographics. We started to say, hey, we're, forget about the big paragraphs. Nobody's going to read it. Let's create something that you know people is going to be interested. We generate a lot of um, reactions when we use the simple visual way of marketing um, our initiatives. We post on social media. So this is one of our, my learning minute example. So we post on you know, the workplace chat. And we have people commented, we have likes, people forwarded, people share. And we'll continue that journey. So we really need to think and act as a marketer, have the marketing techniques to really reach the learners so they trust us. They think what well, you provide is value added. So I am interested in, and I'm willing to take some of that. Last one I want to leave with everyone is just a quote. We cannot become what we need to be by remaining what we are. So I want to encourage everyone to push boundaries, to really look at different ways to innovate, and then help our employees and leaders to really build the capability we want them for the future and upscaling the workforce. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. I'm going to call up Helen, Gina, and uh, Alan, please. I'm going to have a seat. And Julie Brisky, who is our Director of Talent Initiatives and a key strategist and project lead of our Future Skills work, is going to facilitate this Q&A session. So thank you very much, uh, Gina, Helen, and Alan, for your lovely presentations. They were really outstanding. And I'm sure we've got a lot of great questions. So let me turn it over to the audience and uh, see what's on people's minds. Uh, could you just provide us with an example of the assignments that you talk about that are, are provided for people to try? Who provides them and could you give us some examples? Sure. Um, and actually, if you want to go deeper on it, Shelley and Janet are just at the table next to you and they're the ones who have designed and developed a number of the components of the program. So the, the assignments are different depending on what stream we're talking about. Um, we have a, a variety of things, including having the individuals create their own video that explains the key concepts so that they're able to actually pay it forward and we're able to utilize that content, the video content, to be able to bring it into our library and start to have almost the user-generated content. So they have to be able to distill it, they have to be able to convey it in an interesting way, and they, they need to be able to you know, play it back, not just by rote, but by actually internalizing it. There's also some, um, some opportunities to, to do um, small projects, and there's some opportunities to participate within the community and being able to kind of drive knowledge out. So there's a number of different ways. They usually have a choice of how they've applied it, and then they're able to contribute to the broader learning as a result of showing what they've learned and how they've learned it. I'm in the, uh, the Agile space as well at TIPC. So just in your Agile role, especially when you're looking how did service design grow as a result? So um, in terms of being able to find, did it grow as a COE on its own and work alongside the, uh, the Agile teams, or were they all embedded? And I'm curious how that, how that grew up. When you say service design, do you, uh, in our, are you thinking about um, client experience? Yes. 
Oh, great. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, I'm not as familiar with that, but I will, I will talk a little bit about it. I would say two things. One, um, we have always had a client experience. I said client focus has always been a, a, a value of ours, if you will. But in, in parallel to the agile growth, this really um, overt sense of uh, client experience science almost and how do we build client insights and how do we then do design thinking. And then in the Agile setting, you usually have someone who's a design thinking SME and who brings that sort of knowledge of how do I bring in the client and drag them through this process with me so that we can get their insights real time in the Agile lab, as well as um, analytics and marketers who can bring sort of the, the client insights to bear. Um, that would tend to more be outside the Agile lab, but that's from the, the client experience for the marketing teams themselves. Um, interestingly, we're doing the same thing on the employee experience side. So we have an employee experience experience COE, which is doing research, employee listening, trying to find out exactly how the employee feels about their experience. And then we put design thinkers into our uh, HR accelerator labs, these agile labs, to help design great employee experiences from that employee lens. Is that? Yeah. But yes, the design thinking as a capability has grown in parallel. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you so much, Alan. Other questions for our team? I, I, uh, we've got such a great opportunity to have them here. Monica. Yeah, question for Gina and, um, and Helen. How do you think about uh, the investment in talent and then uh, making sure you retain that talent and they're not poached somewhere else because you've got, done such a fantastic job training them? That's, I think that's a million dollar question, right? Um, so I think um, Alan, you mentioned, right, we're at war with talent. It's so hard to get to attract the best talent in the market to get them in, right? We, For example, anytime we have a posting, we do have a lot of people apply, but who is the best talent? And once they're in, you don't want to lose them. So a lot of times, you know, at Sun Life, we're talking about the retention part. I think part of it is we also we give them, um, give talent a, a kind of a clear, clear path, like, are you on the high potential list? Are we willing to invest in you? We have pretty rigorous succession planning, and we encourage our leaders, you know, to start to be more transparent. Because in the past, right, we don't we hide our succession list. We don't tell you you have high potential until the day you leave. We say, but you're high potential, but I don't know, right? So we're trying to have that the conversation between leaders and their employees. And we also encourage them, right, to take on different um, assignment. We all know learning happen mostly when you uh, experience that, right, the experiential learning. So once we know, you know, the talent aspiration, we know their performance, and we also assess their potential, we're really willing to put them on the um, accelerated path. You know, give them visibility, give them exposure, but also to look at that lattice move, right, and that experience that Gina talked about. Um, th definitely, there are always going to be a time you're going to lose your talent to someone else, right? Um, maybe, I know, um, we have a lot of Sun Life employees going to RBC, going to BMO, going to TD, and of course, we kind of, uh, we <laughs> <laughs> so we have a shared pool of talent, right? At the same time, we always remind ourselves, every opportunity we get, you also, you know, uh, take that opportunity to upskill, to build the capability you never had, to take it as an opportunity on that. Um, and I think build that uh, community of practice for the talent to know they have learning partners in the organization, they have mentors, they have sponsors, that also gonna help, you know, for them to stay with the organization. So Gina, you have a lot more to share. Um, so the, there's this great quote that says, um, you know, what if we train our people and they leave? And the counterpoint is, what if we don't and they stay? Yeah. Uh, and so I think it's just, it's so important to be all in on helping people build the skills they need for tomorrow, as well as the skills they need for today. And I think learning is only one component of what you offer to them as a company. So as Helen was saying, you know, there's elements around broader career development. There's, there's ability to grow in the biggest sense. But there's also, what do you stand for as a company? What are your values? What are the opportunities that you, you give people to make a difference beyond themselves, you know, in, into what really matters to them? And I think, you know, as we've, as we've been going along on our journey, we know that careers is the number one reason why people come 
and the number one reason they stay, and if they don't get what they're looking for, why they leave. And so we've tried to really think holistically about that and look for the broader parts of that ecosystem where we can really help people be successful on their terms as well as ours. And making sure that we're building in these, these unique experiences. We're giving them opportunities to grow in unique ways. Uh, we're giving them learning opportunities that aren't just the traditional. I mean, we're very, um, we're very proud to have a corporate university at BMO called the Institute for Learning. So BMO IFL, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. And it's a unique facility where we have 70,000 people come through the door every year. So we see that as being a really great proof point around commitment to learning and development, but we can't be complacent in that, which is why we keep pushing out and developing new ways to engage people, to develop people, to, to give them opportunities. And you know, when we moved into the digital badging space around some of the certifications we were giving, um, leaders were saying, well, doesn't that make it easier for people to poach our talent? So if somebody posts on LinkedIn or posts on Twitter that they got this digital badge for a cutting edge skill, well, I think people who are going to leave will leave anyway. But if it's only one program out of many that you offer, I think people will stick around and learn more. And when people in their network see what you're able to offer, I think it'll draw more people to you. Um, and you know, the one last point I'd want to make is, at the end of the day, some people will leave. And so part of our philosophy is, how do you make sure that they've had the very best experience with your company so they are passionate alumni? And even if they're leaving to do something else right now, they may come back in the future. And even if they don't, can they be advocates for your brand? Can I just add to that? I actually have a story around Gina's last point. So January on LinkedIn, I saw a posting. It was uh, someone who used to work for Sun Life. So the posting is really about how grateful he is um, through the last so many years and how many talented people he's met and how solid Sun Life is. And he's leaving, but he would recommend anyone who worked for Sun Life. And the last sentence is, if you have opportunities you think is a good fit, let me know. I was really touched by that posting. I think that's a, such a good way to illustrate someone who has experience with the Sun Live, even the, though they leave, they're still helping build that brand recognition. Two of you, and, and Helen, you probably have them as well, but Alan and Gina, you talked about the communities, uh, learning communities. And uh, I'm wondering about that because I think it's such a great way to get together and practice in a safe environment. What's your experience with the, with the learning communities? Do you find that they have been uh, structured or more organic? How do you find that that plays out? So we actually have both structured and un unstructured. So we have communities of practice uh, where we bring people together in, in a more structured way and we really focus on sharing leading practice, sharing um, particular almost show and tell opportunities of how people have developed skills and what they've accomplished and, and some of the projects they've worked on, as well as being able to bring wicked problems to the table where they're actually able to help solve it as a group. So we've got some structured communities that happen in that way, and then we've got broader, more organic learning communities where we actually really encourage conversation, discussion, um, sharing of resources, being able to you know, keep an eye on the landscape as it's going, and they keep growing and learning together. And so uh, both are really important, and I think both appeal to different types of people who are at different places in their learning journey. Uh, that's pretty much the perfect answer. Uh, I, I, I would say uh, to expand on the one point is thinking thoughtfully about where you want those formal Com communities to be, and it's actually something Jean and I had talked about recently. I'm learning from her on this. Uh, but where do you govern, and where do you thoughtfully say these are enterprise or these are you know disciplined learning communities, and where do you let people sort of the wild west of communities grow? Uh, I think is very important. So that you n are focusing people on the things that you think are most important. Um, we also have what we call that GLP and Global Learning Professional Network, um, more as kind of like a formal community. And we also have the organic learning communities among business unit. In fact, we have uh, more than 100 learning professionals outside of you know, um, our corporate learning development world. And they actually take care of right, the technical training and local initiative, and they form also a tight community within um, the bigger organization as well. Thank you so much. 
I want to thank you again, uh, each of you, for your thoughtful presentations and your flawless execution. And it really was terrific to learn from you today. Uh, we do have a commitment to get you out on time, so I will pass it back to Jennifer Reynolds to close us off. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, the panelists. I appreciate that. I think this is obviously something I don't think anyone has, you, you know, the, the secret sauce necessarily for the whole solution. And so sharing our stories is, is very important. I think it uh, certainly learning those best practices, uh, developing them together is very, very helpful. So we'll continue to um, uh, have this dialogue with our, our community, with our stakeholders, and always looking for feedback from people. On that note, actually, there is um, a form in the middle of the table. If you can take the time to provide your thoughts, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, always feel free to reach out, though, um, with any thoughts around talent issues or otherwise for Toronto Finance International. And also, one final thing, the uh, study is available on the website. So if you haven't had a chance to read it, please do uh, have a look. So thank you very much for coming, and thank you to the talent team for putting this together today.